Now that you know the basics of how the autonomic nervous system affects the heart, let's look at a little more detail and exactly how it brings about those effects. So the sympathetic, remember, is going to act on both the heart rate and the force of contraction because it branches down to the node and the ventricles. The parasympathetic is going to act on heart rate only because it goes just to the nodes. So down here we have this for parasympathetic because notice here is a picture of a nodal cell. Parasympathetic is node only and parasympathetic is going to slow it down. It decreases heart rate. This next section is for sympathetic because it has a node and it has a picture of muscle. You should recognize this picture from chapter 10. That's what it looks like inside a muscle cell. That's the sarcomere. So just like the sarcomeres you learned about for skeletal muscle in chapter 10, you have sarcomeres and cardiac muscle also. And remember, sympathetic is going to increase heart rate by acting on the node, and it's going to increase force by acting on the muscle. And when you increase force, you increase stroke volume. SV is stroke volume. This is the amount of blood that the ventricle pumps into the artery per beat. And it's not total for the whole heart, it's per ventricle. So each ventricle has its own stroke volume. So you have the stroke volume of the right ventricle pumping into the pulmonary trunk and the stroke volume of the left ventricle pumping into the aorta. And the way you alter stroke volume is by altering force. So we're going to talk about how sympathetic alters the force and then that ultimately is going to alter the stroke volume. Another thing to keep in mind is to keep these things separate. They are two separate things. Heart rate is the number of beats per minute. And stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped per beat. Students tend to want to use these interchangeably or mix them up, like start off a sentence starting about stroke volume and then finish the sentence with heart rate. Don't do that. Keep them separate from each other. So now let's look at exactly how these items are going to work. So remember we have that cycle. We have negative 60. That causes the sodium gates to open and sodium comes in which brings you up to negative 40. This causes the calcium gates to open and calcium comes in, which brings you to zero, which causes the potassium gates to open, potassium goes out, and you return to negative 60. If we look at that on a number scale, you have your negative 60, your negative 40, your zero. So the sodium brings you from negative 60 up to negative 40, the calcium brings you from negative 40 up to zero, and then potassium takes you back down to negative 60, and then you start over again. Acetylcholine, so remember parasympathetic is going to secrete acetylcholine onto here from the vagus nerve. It's going to slow this down. It's going to make this take longer. So if you think about this, what could make it take longer? 
Well, if we make this a little more negative, let's say we go down to negative 70, just to kind of pick a number that's less than negative 60. If you do that, then the sodium has more work to do. It's going to take longer for sodium to get up to negative 40 if you're starting at negative 70 than if you started at negative 60. You essentially move back the starting line. So if you can move back the starting line, then it's going to take longer for sodium to do its job. So think about how you would move back the starting line. Well, potassium is what lowers the voltage. If potassium goes out and you go down to negative 60, well, let's say now we want to get to negative 70, you would accomplish that by letting more potassium out. You would have to keep those potassium gates open. So if you let more potassium out, you will hyperpolarize. Okay, think back to chapter 12. You learned about hyperpolarize. This lower number is the hyperpolarize. So if you can open extra potassium gates, let extra potassium out, that will make it more negative, hyperpolarize, and then it will take longer for sodium to bring you up to negative 40. That is what acetylcholine does. Acetylcholine acts here. Acetylcholine opens potassium gates. And when that happens, you have more potassium out. And so instead of going to negative 60, you hyperpolarize. Now, it's not always necessarily exactly negative 70. I'm just using that number as an example to give you the idea that you hyperpolarize. You make it more negative. So then you've moved back the starting line for sodium. Sodium has to start at a lower number. So this part takes longer. And you have therefore slowed the heart rate. Okay, so that is the effect of parasympathetic. Parasympathetic reduces heart rate. Remember that parasympathetic does not go to the muscle. Remember down here, the vagus nerve does not branch down to the ventricles. So parasympathetic has no effect on force. Now let's look at sympathetic. Sympathetic is going to end up increasing heart rate, making the node go faster. So again, we have that cycle. We have negative 60, which causes the sodium gates to open. Sodium comes in, and you go to negative 40. This causes the calcium gates to open. Calcium comes in, you go to zero. This causes the potassium gates to open. Potassium goes out, you return to negative 60. Here's that, here it is on the number scale again. Sodium brings you from negative 60 to negative 40. Calcium brings you from negative 40 to zero. Potassium takes you back down to negative 60. Now we wanna make this go faster. We're gonna make this go faster by opening more calcium gates. So norepinephrine is gonna act here. Norepinephrine opens extra calcium gates. So you have more calcium in. So that means this part from negative 40 to zero happens faster. So we're gonna have more calcium coming in, 
So we're going to get from negative 40 to 0 faster. And that's how you increase the heart rate. If we look at the muscle, you have to think back to chapter 10 and what you learned about how muscle contracts. Remember you have the actin and the myosin, and the myosins bind to the actin and pull them in, and then the Z disc is out here attached to that, and that pulls the Z disc in, and the sarcomere is shorter, and the muscle is contracted. If you don't remember that, go back and review chapter 10. You have to understand that sliding filament theory. Remember also tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin is blocking the myosin and actin from binding to each other. You have to move it. The way you move it is by having calcium bind troponin. When calcium binds troponin, it moves tropomyosin so that you can then form a cross bridge between myosin and actin. So remember, calcium binds troponin to move tropomyosin. Sorry, that's an arrow so that you can form a cross bridge. And once you form a cross bridge, then the myosin pulls the actin in and the muscle contracts. It's kind of a simplified version. If you go back to chapter 10, you have all the detailed steps. The main point here is that you need calcium to form cross bridges and that you need cross bridges to contract. The more calcium you have, the more cross bridges you can form. Think of playing tug of war, and each cross bridge is a person who's grabbing the rope. Remember, cross bridges are connections between the myosin and actin. Well, the more connections you make, the more force it can pull, right? If you have more people on your tug of war team, you have more hands grabbing that rope, more people pulling, you're going to have more force. So more cross bridges means more force. So you're going to, sympathetic increases the force by increasing the calcium. Now, if you think back to chapter 10, remember calcium is stored in sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum when you get the nerve signal. So let's talk a little general stuff about muscles here. So in a muscle cell, you store calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it is released when you get that signal. Remember the action potential. So it's released when you have an action potential in the T-tubule. In cardiac muscle, you have two sources of calcium. So you have calcium that is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, just like you learned about with skeletal muscle. So when that action potential from the node reaches the cardiac muscle cell, it's going to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that stored calcium, just like you learned about back in chapter 10. But you also have a second source. Extracellular calcium will enter the muscle cell.
both of these calciums will be used to form cross bridges. The amount that comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a set amount. You can't alter that. But you can control how much comes in from extracellular. So this is where sympathetic comes in. Sympathetic increases this one. So the more norepinephrine you have equals more calcium that enters, which means more cross bridges, which means more force. And remember, if you have more force, you also increase your stroke volume the amount of blood that that ventricle is going to pump into the artery. Okay, so we know that sympathetic is going to increase heart rate by letting more calcium in so that you go from negative 40 to zero faster, and it's going to increase force by letting more calcium in so you make more cross bridges. Now we need to see how norepinephrine lets more calcium in. Now this part is going to be the same for both the node and the muscle. So again, remember, it's important to keep node and muscle separate. When we're talking about the node, we're talking about heart rate. When we're talking about the muscle, we're talking about force and stroke volume. Don't mix those up. But the way norepinephrine lets more calcium in is the same for the node and the muscle. The result of the more calcium is different. The result of more calcium in the node is you go from negative 40 to zero faster. The result of more calcium in the muscle is you get more cross bridges. But we're going to look at the similarity here and how the norepinephrine lets more calcium in. So if we have a cell, we're going to use just a different color here that will represent both the node and the muscle. Here's a cell. Your cells have beta receptors. At least your heart cells do anyway. If you remember from chapter 15, a beta receptor is what norepinephrine binds to. You also have the calcium gates. This is where the calcium comes in. Now remember, if it's a node, the calcium coming in is going to increase heart rate. If it's a muscle cell, the calcium coming in is going to increase force. But they both use the same method to let that extra calcium in. There's another molecule in here called C-AMP, cyclic AMP. Think back to chapter 17 when you learned about hormones. Remember, water-soluble hormones bind to a receptor on the surface of the cell. Beta receptor is on the surface. Norepinephrine is a water-soluble hormone. If you've forgotten this, pause the video and flip back to chapter 17 and review water-soluble hormones. When they bind to that receptor on the surface, they activate a second messenger. C-AMP is the second messenger. And then, again, flip back to your chapter 17 notes about water-soluble hormones. Second messengers will either activate an enzyme or open a channel or open a gate. 
So what you have here is norepinephrine binds to the beta receptor. So this is going to be step one. Norepinephrine binds to your beta receptor. Step two is that that then activates the C amp, the second messenger. Then step three is the C amp opens the calcium gate. And then step four is extra calcium enters. Then step five depends on if it's a node or a muscle. So step five in a node would be increased heart rate. Step five in a muscle would be the increased force due to the more cross bridges. Okay, so take a minute, make sure this stuff makes sense. Maybe even rewatch this, get this soaked into your head. Next, we're gonna look at how some different drugs can act on this. So we have beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. So a beta blocker You may have heard of these, like especially if you already work in a nursing home or a hospital or something where you're taking care of patients and giving them their meds, a lot of older people are on beta blockers. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are both drugs that are used to reduce blood pressure. And the way they reduce blood pressure your blood pressure is related to your heart rate and your stroke volume. So if you can reduce heart rate and stroke volume, you will reduce blood pressure. So they reduce blood pressure by reducing heart rate and stroke volume. Well, you can do that by blocking the extra calcium that norepinephrine causes. Okay, think back to chapter 15. You always have some norepinephrine. You can turn it up, you can turn it down, but you never turn it off. There's always some norepinephrine in your body. That norepinephrine is always causing you to let extra calcium into your heart. If you can stop that extra calcium from coming in, then you're not raising your heart rate, you're not raising your force. So those would therefore go down. Okay, so again, think about that. Norepinephrine is always letting extra calcium into your heart. These drugs work by preventing that. They stop the norepinephrine from letting the extra calcium in. Beta blocker drugs are just like their name says. A beta blocker would come in right here and it prevents step one. So if you're on a beta blocker drug, step one doesn't happen. Well, if step one doesn't happen, neither do steps three, four, and five. So then you're gonna reduce your blood pressure by stopping this. A calcium channel blocker works over here. You can still have step one and two, but when it comes to step three, that's where the calcium channel blocker comes in. and says, oh no, you're not coming in here extra calcium and it, it just kind of sits there and blocks it. It doesn't let it in. So again, you don't get the extra calcium in. Okay, then digoxin is our other drug. Up here I have this. If you know old rock and roll, the Eagles in Hotel California. This song reminds me of digoxin. 
So the point is you can never leave. That is the part that reminds me of digoxin. So if we look at what digoxin does, digoxin is used to strengthen a weak heart. So like if someone has heart failure and their heart is just weak and it can't pump very well, they're going to have a really low stroke volume. So digoxin is in there to increase the strength, increase the force of the contraction and get that stroke volume up. So the point of digoxin is to increase the force. Well, if you have, if you want more force, that means you need more cross bridges. And if you want to have more cross bridges, that means you need more calcium. So remember, you have calcium that comes in from outside. Well, that calcium is constantly moving in and out. This extra calcium that comes in, it then turns around and goes back out between heartbeats. It doesn't just stay in there. So the calcium comes in and then it goes back out. Let's just go ahead and make a fresh picture here. You have calcium comes in and you get some cross bridges then after the heart beats it goes back out and then it just comes back in the next heartbeat so it's constantly cycling back and forth in and out digoxin comes in right here and it blocks the exit so that's why it's like the Hotel California the calcium comes in but it can't leave. So then with the next heartbeat, more calcium comes in again, right? You're eating calcium as part of your diet, so you're not gonna run out. With every heartbeat, more calcium comes in, but it can't leave. So this causes you to build up calcium inside that muscle cell. And all that calcium building up means you're gonna get more cross bridges. And by having more cross bridges, you're gonna increase the force. So that is how digoxin works to increase the strength or the force of contraction in a heart that is weak.